Northwest Now is supported, in part, by viewers like you. Thank you. Mark, T minus three minutes and 30 seconds and counting. We have completed our communications checks with the Apollo 8 astronauts in the cabin, and the communications are go. Ten, nine, we have ignition sequence start. The engines are on. Four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit. We have, we have liftoff. Liftoff at 7.51 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. December 21st, 1968, Apollo 8 tears through Earth's atmosphere. The first trip to another world and the first manned Saturn V rocket. Three million parts, all working in harmony. The most powerful machine ever built. Apollo 8, you're looking good. Retired Air Force General Bill Anders lived near the Bremerton Naval Yard as a kid. And it's that fondness for Western Washington that brought him back to the San Juans to retire. But in 1968, he was aboard Apollo 8, one of only 24 men to leave Earth's orbit. Like many young men from military families, it was always assumed young Bill would just follow in his father's footsteps and go right into the Navy. But that is not how it worked out. Well, I got to the Naval Academy and uh, went out on the second year cruise uh, on a carrier, the USS Bennington, straight deck, open bow, um, belch smoke all over the place. They had a Marine Reserve Squadron on there, and uh, boy, the first night some young uh, Marine came in in a Panther, flew over every barrier, flew over the net, and crashed into the pack. Well, this was right at the end of the Korean War, so the next day we spent our time pushing airplanes over the side, and I'm thinking, gee, some of these don't seem to be that banged up, maybe they'll give me one. But I began to wonder, and I thought, you know, old Kurt LeMay and 10,000 feet of concrete as the buildup of SAC and the Air Force, uh, maybe that'd be better than naval aviation. So that's why I elected to be commissioned directly in the United States Air Force. A lot of folks who served during the Cold War in aviation have a story about the time they encountered the enemy. Have any stories from the Cold War in your fighter interceptor days? Well, I was stationed in Iceland and uh, flying F-89 Scorpions. And uh, one day we got uh, what we called a mandatory scramble. And uh, so off I went with my wingman and we went due east and got to the edge of the Iceland and they reported that they thought there was bear bomber. Uh, going just right at the edge of the identification zone. So I went into afterburner, came up alongside of him, and uh, these guys were looking out the, the windows, waving. And, uh, but I couldn't resist giving them the finger. And I mentioned to Tom Cruise in, uh, in Top Gun uh, that I was the first guy to do it. Anders loved the 1,000-mile-an-hour thrills found in the cockpit of planes like the F-101 Voodoo. Anders knew NASA wanted test pilots, but command sent him into a master's-level nuclear engineering program instead, only delaying his relentless push to become a test pilot. So I was applying like mad for test pilot school when I uh, heard over the radio uh, driving home from work one, uh, one Friday afternoon uh, this announcement that NASA was looking for a new group of astronauts. I really didn't pay that much attention until I realized the guy saying, well, your test pilot would help, you know, and, and uh, blah, blah, blah. And he said, or you can have an advanced degree in engineering. So I whipped my Volkswagen bus off to the side, waited for the 15-minute news cycle, and wrote down the address for NASA. Anders applied, but was supposed to go through an Air Force selection process first, where none other than General Chuck Yeager was making the selections and was also under the impression that he was the only point of contact with NASA. Well, the next day I got a call from Yeager, who I'd been pestering about the, uh, getting into the class. And he said, well, Bill, I'm sorry to tell you you didn't make it, but try again next year. And I have made it first in a series of errors. I said, well, uh, Colonel Yeager, uh, I got to tell you, I got a better offer. That was a mistake. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, well, I've been selected. 
already and to go to NASA. He said, impossible. I said, what do you mean? And uh, he said, because I sat on the Air Force screening board and all the forms that came in, if the guy wasn't a test pilot, we threw him out. Well, that kind of made me mad. I said, well, sir, I said, you know, uh, maybe that's the case, but I, it must have been my, the other letter I wrote. He said, you went around channels, I'm going to have you kicked out. Slammed the phone down, I thought, uh-oh, now I'm in trouble. Now, I didn't realize that the NASA astronauts and the boss, Deke Slayton, really didn't like Chuck Yeager. And so I called Slayton and told him, well, that locked me in. <laughs> and uh, so off I went, and then Yeager and I eventually patched up our differences. Apollo crew director Deke Slayton eventually made Anders a backup on Gemini 11, and then a backup lunar module pilot on Apollo 11. But then, disaster struck. Anders remembers that fateful day in January of 1967, when the pure oxygen in the Apollo 1 command module fueled a violent fire, killing astronauts Gus Grissom, Roger Chaffee, and Ed White. And I just happened to live right around the corner from Pat White. And uh, so I was tagged. Uh, I'd been out working in the yard to uh, go and tell Pat White, so I quickly changed into something clean. Drove over there, and here Pat was on her doorstep. Jan Armstrong was there, uh, but Pat, I don't think, knew the situation. And uh, so as I walked up the steps, maybe just by the look on my face, I think she could tell. The loss of Apollo 1 reshuffled crews and mission profiles, but there was little time for mourning. Anders' sometimes grueling training schedule continued. Well, as far as the training went, uh, we had, uh, the hardest part was the centrifuge. They put us in there and ran us up uh, to a pulse of 16 Gs. If you've ever had an elephant sit on your chest, uh, that's what it felt like. We had a little task to do and it was like looking, most of the guys passed out. I managed to kind of look like I was looking through a soda straw, but it was uh, 16 Gs for about 20 seconds. That was the toughest part. All the school, time, and training finally paid off. Anders got a primary crew assignment on Apollo 8 as the lunar module pilot. The training intensified, and he linked up with Apollo 11 Commander Neil Armstrong in Houston to fly the lunar landing training vehicle, which was a handful. Well, I actually got to fly it pretty good. In fact, I would say, quite frankly, I'm sorry, Neil, I could fly it better than he could. Uh, well, for different reasons, uh, it crashed, or he, Neil was on board when it ran out of attitude fuel. So they were down to one, and, it, and looking at the records, it turns out I was the only lunar module pilot, even for the ones that landed on the moon, that ever flew the lunar landing training vehicle. Anders flew that trainer in preparation for Apollo 8's original mission, a lunar module test flight in the relative safety of Earth orbit. Apollo 6 and 7 launched in 1968, setting the stage for Apollo 8. But back on Earth, 1968 was a very bad year, with the My Lai Massacre and the Tet Offensive demonstrating the futility of the Vietnam War and the assassinations of Martin Luther King and Robert F. Kennedy. While the civilian and political worlds viewed the Apollo program as a morale booster, for NASA insiders and the flight crews, it was still all about fighting the Cold War. Frank Borman is fond of saying, and accurate, that, well, Apollo was just another battle in the Cold War. It wasn't exploration. It wasn't, you know, to invent Velcro or, or microchips. It was to beat the dirty commies. And, uh, and so even though they've become our friends, pretty much our friends today, uh, it was a Cold War mission. And so we were focused on doing that and worried that maybe the Soviets would uh, beat us to the punch. That fear radically changed Anders' Apollo 8 mission profile and advanced the date by months. So Anders' lunar module wasn't going to be ready. But while he was losing one thing, he was gaining another. So when the NASA headquarters uh, or uh, the NASA uh, Johnson Spacecraft Center leadership began worrying that the Soviets were going to put one just up and around the moon, not into lunar orbit, and came up with the Apollo 8 
change which caused me to lose my lunar module, I frankly was quite disappointed. So they swapped positions, Apollo 8 and Apollo 9. Uh, we gave them our lunar module. We took their command module and, uh, and their Saturn V and, uh, and went around the moon. Now, of course, this was you know, easier said than done because one, nobody had been out of Earth orbit before and nobody had ridden on the Saturn V before. The massive Saturn V was by no means a sure thing. Its most recent launch was an unmanned Apollo 6 mission plagued by a phenomena called POGO, causing severe vibrations and stage misfires that on a manned mission would have been an abort in the best case scenario. But after more testing and repairs on the ground, mind you, NASA declared Apollo 8 Saturn V man-rated and go for launch. Some called it the biggest gamble in the manned space program. Good morning, I'm Frank Reynolds, and these are the men who will make this historic voyage to the moon, the crew of Apollo 8. I was not going to sit there and worry about whether the damn thing worked or not. I mean, Frank's job was to say it would. And uh, I must say, getting up at the, uh, climbing up, or going up the elevator up the gantry, I did re realize that it was a big rocket and uh, 35 stories high, you know, six or seven and a half million pounds of thrust, a mini A-bomb. Uh, but, you know, we were, we were coal warriors. That was our job. And uh, we weren't there, you know, just to get a ride as a tourist in space. And so it was part of our job, and I wasn't going to sit there and brood about it. In fact, in retrospect, looking back over the whole flight, it was a lot safer than chasing Russians in Iceland, and it was certainly a lot safer than what my colleagues were doing in Vietnam, you know, racing around with uh, the Vietnamese trying to s stick a, you know, a telephone pole-sized rocket in their rear ends. So you're the first man crew on the Saturn V. You're going up the elevator. You see what a massive machine it is. You have confidence, but there's also a little apprehension there, I'm sure. And then there's this story. Did you fall asleep waiting for launch? Are you really that cool or you're just that tired? <laughs> well, I was laying there watching this uh, mother mud dauber build a nest, you know, in the, right in the window. And I'm thinking, you know, lady, you better find a better place for your babies because they're going to last long. But then I did uh, kind of doze off there for a while. And, uh, but, uh, you know, right up until launch, I was pretty relaxed. I must say, after, right after launch, it was a big surprise because it wasn't what I expected. And it was so loud and so violent that had there been a problem, no way I could have told Borman uh, about it. Fortunately, Frank was smart enough to take his hand off the abort panel. And if you tried to hit a button here, God knows where you'd have, you'd have gone because it was just, felt like being a rat in the jaws of a giant terrier. Despite all the violence, the Saturn V propelled the crew right into orbit. Two hours later, another rocket fired, and Anders became one of the first three men to travel through interplanetary space, all while setting a new human speed record of 24,200 miles per hour. Apollo 8 Houston, your trajectory and guidance are go, over. Gliding through the void of space, NASA ordered crew members not to view the new moon as they approached, since the sun was almost directly behind it, causing an eclipse and a potentially blinding corona. So we didn't see the moon until we were essentially in Earth, in lunar orbit. Uh, watching the Earth shrink away, now that was kind of you're thinking, boy, we're a long way from home. <laughs> as we approached the moon, we turned the spacecraft, Frank Borman turned the spacecraft backwards so that when we turned on our the last remaining engine, the service propulsion engine, uh, it would slow us down so that the weaker lunar gravity could catch us and trap us into uh, a lunar orbit. We were going to miss the moon by 60 miles, like trying to outrace a freight train and miss it by the paint on the side of your car. Um, and so we were going backwards, and the first thing that happened, we went into the shadow of the moon, the umbra, so to speak. Uh, but we could still, you know, still see the Earth. Uh, then we went into uh, the double umbra, where neither sunshine nor Earthshine uh, hit us, and it talked about black. That was as black as I could remember. 
and it just, the stars exploded. I mean, there were even the weakest you could see. You couldn't really tell the constellations because all the little ones, you know, look pretty bright as well. And I remember looking over my shoulder kind of like that, and there was this big black hole, nothing. And that was the moon itself. And, uh, and, and I must say the hair came up on the back of my neck a little bit. But then we, we went and uh, had our, did our burn, or started doing our, our, our burn, and just before it started, I noticed what looked like oil running down the window of the spacecraft. And it turned out that that was the lunar sunrise on the lunar mountains, the long shadows. And I refocused my eyes and I thought, wow, look at that. And uh, Borman yelled at both Lovell and I said, get back in here, do your job. We got to get this burn right to get us into lunar orbit. It all worked just as scripted. Gliding into orbit allowed the crew to see the backside of the moon, another first for mankind. Apollo 8 orbited the moon three times upside down and backwards as it settled in about 60 miles above the surface. Then the flight plan called for rolling and going heads up for the final seven orbits. Suddenly something caught my eye and I looked over there and here was this gorgeous view of the Earth. And uh, I said something like, my gosh, look at that. And of course everybody you know, basically saw it almost at the same time. So I grabbed a camera and even though there had been no instructions, no plan, no light meters or anything to uh, take a picture of the moon, I grabbed a camera and a with color film and uh, started taking pictures. And Frank Borman jokingly said, hey Bill, you can't do that, it's not on the flight plan. But I, I did it with a long lens and it actually put color film on it. And uh, that was the one that uh, NASA picked, color and large because of the telephoto lens uh, that they chose for the stamp, which then became uh, the Earthrise. But Anders says at first, it was the pictures of the whole tiny Earth by itself from the moon that really expanded his consciousness. I'm even more impressed by the pictures we took of the Earth, which are about the size of your fist at, long, at, at arm's length at, lo at lunar distance, because those, I think, have a, have a great philosophical issue in that, it, you know, one arm's length here to the moon, that's nowhere in space. Uh, ten arms lengths, you know, now the Earth goes down to one-tenth. A hundred arms length, you know, now it's the size of a BB. Doesn't take much to have it go to a grain of sand, and at, the, at those distances, you're still nowhere near, say, to Mars. So when people talk about going to Mars, they got there, they're not thinking about the distance involved. And so though, that, those pictures impress me that one, the Earth is small, and delicate, it was like a Christmas tree ornament, and uh, it needs, it's fragile, and so we need to understand how to take it. So my psycho philosophical impressions were more initially with that. But once the Apollo 8 film was developed and the images passed around, it was the Anders photo, soon after named Earthrise, that really changed everything. The Earthrise picture uh, particularly taken against such a stark lunar horizon, unfriendly horizon. And uh, like Frank Borman said, you know, miles of nothingness. Uh, that our home planet, you know, was a beautiful place and we really needed to uh, treat it with care. And, uh, and that really gave a kickstart to the environmental movement. And uh, I've often thought it would be Really great if we could get the world's leaders up there and see the moon, see the Earth at lunar distances. Maybe they'd quit throwing rocks and stones and rockets at each other. But there was another memorable moment to come. The mission called for a worldwide television broadcast on Christmas Eve. A billion people tuned in. Anders was raised Catholic, but his encounter with the vastness of the universe left him feeling less a child of God and more of an insignificant coincidence in an endless void. In 1968, though, before all that really sank in, it was his voice reading the first four verses of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was out form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved 
moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. After 10 lunar orbits, it was time for Apollo 8 to go. The ship's only remaining rocket had to fire to return to Earth. Anders says it burped a little, but it worked, causing Jim Lovell to say, there is a Santa Claus. Then during the glide home, possibly the mission's worst moment, when the crucial navigational tool known as the eight ball lost its orientation. We knew exactly where we were. The ground knew even better than we, but we didn't know how we were. We didn't know whether we were this way or that way, and you couldn't sight. There weren't any real stars to see, but you know, looking at the sun, you, it, you were, that wasn't accurate enough, because if we were off by just a few degrees, we could bounce out and go into an orbit where we would, uh, we would suffocate eventually, or we'd dig in and burn up. So there was a real scramble uh, to try to get the platform reoriented. But that was pretty hairy because it wasn't that long before re-entry and we could have easily burned up. That never has really made the press. I was going to say, you almost had your own Apollo 13 moment there a little bit. Uh, oh, yeah, it could have, uh, it could have been, uh, you know, if they made it, we wouldn't have. Back on track, Apollo 8 was lined up to be the fastest, hottest re-entry ever, and the first one at night. Anders says splashdown was a rough one. And we hit the water with the biggest belly buster you could imagine, and it hit so wave coming up, it, I thought it cracked the spacecraft because all the water that had collected in the spacecraft around the pipes from sweat uh, was now, you know, went to the bottom and then it splashed up. And uh, Borman had a hand, had a switch that he was going to throw to blow the parachutes off. Well, it, it hit so hard, it kind of knocked him out a little bit and his hand came off the switch and it didn't take long with the spacecraft then went upside down. Flotation balloons were quickly deployed to right the capsule in 10-foot swells south of Hawaii. But the splashdown ordeal wasn't over yet. But it was very rough. Poor Frank got sick. Jim and I didn't have much mercy because we were both Naval Academy. Uh, but hell, we could hear the helicopter coming in and see its floodlight. But it was still dark and the, and the frogmen understandably didn't want to jump in because, you know, there were sharks. And so when sun came up, and I guess they shot a few sharks, so that didn't make the newspapers either. Apollo 8 arrived to much fanfare, ticker tape parades in Houston, and also New York and Chicago. The crew was named Time Magazine's Men of the Year. Back at NASA, Anders was named the Apollo 11 Backup Command Module Pilot, but he watched the moon landing in the Armstrong house, talking the wives through the mission. That's one small step for man, not long after the moon landing, Anders was assigned a spot on Apollo 13, but he declined, instead choosing to serve in the Nixon administration. Anders went on to a huge corporate career, making his biggest mark as CEO in the turnaround of General Dynamics. As of the summer of 2018, Anders' passion remains flying, doing air shows around the U.S. and at his Heritage of Flight Museum in Burlington. He and Frank Borman are both still flying, and they remain close friends. When I look at the moon, I'm certainly proud that I was able to be the, one of the first to go around it, uh, first to leave the Earth, first to leave, uh, you know, ride the Saturn V, a lot of firsts, some of them which will be remembered by history, a lot of them won't. And, uh, and of course, though, I regret that I wasn't able to walk on the moon. I've often wondered, would I trade the Earthrise uh, notoriety for a chance to walk on the moon? That's a tough one. Probably would. What do you hope your legacy is? When people think someday of Bill Anders, what, what do you want that legacy to be? We can't write our own legacy. Other people write our legacy. And so uh, I just hope that uh, that uh, people will think of Bill Anders as uh, not only a guy who did a, a good job on Apollo 8 and whatnot, but if I write a book, it'll be a lot more about general dynamics and turning that uh, sick company around. Now, jokingly, I, when I told the guy who wanted to know what my legacy was, I wrote to him, I said, but if I could write it, 
it would be to convince Frank Borman and the rest of the world that I'm actually a better pilot than he is. <laughs> the fact is, however, that Anders legacy will always be tightly connected to the Earthrise photo, despite all the effort he makes to downplay it. It really isn't a very good picture. I mean, I won an Emmy for taking a, you know, the TV camera and it's become the iconic picture selected by Time Life, you know, a bunch of magazines as uh, the most influential picture of the 20th century. But frankly, you know, it was just right time, right place. And uh, I'm proud of that, uh, but uh, I didn't have any idea at the time that uh, it would become so iconic. And I remarked, though I did remark, so maybe I'm a little more philosophical than I thought, that I thought it was ironic that we, you know, we came all the way from Earth to explore the moon and what we really discovered was the Earth.